Do I necessarily agree with the take that like, it's okay that I'm fat because I have Gorilla Grip Coochie? Absolutely not. Like that's not really like the answer to sexual confidence either in my opinion. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel. And today, <laughs> talking about Bethany Beale again. I wanna be clear, I wasn't gonna fucking talk about this. I wasn't gonna talk about this. I was gonna leave it alone, but I saw some information about what was actually contained inside of this Zoom call um, and it's egregious. So I think it's important to talk about, especially because I think Bethy is presenting even more harmful advice behind closed doors under the assumption that no one will be able to like find it or critique her and that's really predatory and shitty. So we're talking about that today. I wanna be super clear before we get into this though, that we are going to zoom in on Bethy. We're protecting the privacy of all of the participants in this because like they didn't ask for this and like this isn't about them either. So we're only talking about Bethy today. We're only talking about her advice, which is really easy because she talked for the entire 90 minutes of this Zoom call. So let's get into that. Okay, so there are some clips of this uh, Zoom call that I'm gonna show you because they're necessary and important in my opinion. But I also want to draw your attention to some of the like key takeaways here. I took notes while I watched this uh, depressing Zoom call the first time. And there's a couple of things that I wanna draw your attention to. First of which, the of the actual actionable advice that's given in this 90 minute Zoom call, which again, Bethany speaks for the entire duration of this. She does not allow the participants to turn their mics on ever. Also worth noting is that all of the participants have their cameras turned off except for one uh, by the 40 minute mark. So it really is not, it's not giving Zoom calls so much as it is just like Bethy talking at people, but of the actual actionable advice that she gives that isn't by her stuff or a direct reference to um, like, just go read somebody else's stuff. Um, I think she gives one, two, three, four, five pieces, no, six, sorry, six pieces of real specific actionable advice all of which she's already given away for free on her Instagram um, or in, in some other medium. So in this container, this 90 minute container that's meant to be uh, you know, like educational or illuminating or like, you know, creating an aha moment of some kind, there is literally no useful advice that's actionable, that's specific, that can be applied to your life that she hasn't already given away for free. So she asked these people to pay $35 each to participate in this course to get nothing of value. I just really wanna draw people's attention to this because regardless of whether you agree with Bethany's like content shift or not, it just can't be overstated how poor of an educator she is. She's just ill-equipped to be <laughs> positioning herself as an expert, not only because she just lacks the skills and the certification and the life experience and all those things, but also because like in practice, she provides her audience with nothing. It's very much giving like, go girl, give me nothing. And it's just very <laughs> frustrating to see somebody positioning themselves as like a figurehead in this community when she actually has like zero legs to stand on. Okay, we're gonna watch a short clip of this and then we're gonna talk about it. Or having a certain set of skills. And so it's almost this idea that like, if I looked a certain way, if I had a certain body, if I measured up to this ideal, um, you know, this ideal, then I would finally be like super confident in the bedroom once I reach this. Um, but we obviously know that as life goes on, um, things change, life changes, you have babies. And so that standard of what you think confidence looks like is always kind of changing. And so unfortunately, if that is the mindset that we have, and we think that is what will make me confident in the bedroom, a lot of us will go through seasons where it's like, oh, I actually, I feel kind of good about myself. I've like met this like, you know, emotional standard in my mind. So I'm, I'm kind of feeling good, but then something happens and we're like back in the dumps again. And so I want to talk about how we can be like, Excuse essentially me, YouTube. Okay. Um, I want to talk about this because she speaks about this several times throughout the course. I do want to be clear. There's probably going to need to be a trigger warning on this video for uh, body image and like disordered eating and uh, just body related stuff because Bethy is obsessed with talking about her body and what she thinks the ideal female form is. Um, this comes up several times throughout this course. And I just want to highlight the fact that what she's trying to do here, I think is like illuminate that we can't have our confidence in ourselves and like our sexual confidence be uh, dependent on the way that our body looks. But she frames this as like, you can't be confident or, or you know, have your confidence be about how your body looks because you may be hot now, but one day you'll get ugly, which is like not the take, girl. Like This is not uh, an empowering or uplifting or correct take about confidence. The truth is that we want our confidence in ourselves 
in relationships and like sexually and, and generally to be informed by a feeling of empowerment, by a feeling of respect, by a feeling of like value that we have for ourselves as a human on the inside, right? We shouldn't be telling ourselves that you can't be confident based on your looks because one day you'll get old and ugly. <laughs> We should be telling ourselves that my worthiness should, or my confidence should come from knowing that I'm worthy in all forms, in all ways, not in spite of, but regardless of my body. So I just wanted to highlight that really quick because I don't think this is like the worst track for her to take, but it is still very misguided in my opinion. Okay, before we get any deeper into this Zoom call, I wanna pause and say thank you to this week's sponsor, which is Beducated. You guys know that I love Beducated. For those of you who are not aware, Beducated is an online platform that is dedicated to fact-based learning about sex and intimacy. Beducated has over 100 courses that are taught by industry experts, so the information is always reliable, but it's also fun and inclusive, and it's one of my favorite places to learn about sex. Lately, I've been referring back to a course that I took a while ago called Roadmap to Intimacy, because for those of you who don't know, I recently went through surgery and in the recovery process, I've been feeling a little touch starved. If you've never recovered from like a medical procedure, it's just a difficult time. And so I really appreciated having the course to go back to because the exercises are genuinely so fun and like promote a feeling of closeness for me and Erin without making uh, the whole thing feel like a, a pressure to have sex or like to have intercourse necessarily. And so I love that there's content on the website that helps to promote that learning about intimacy and closeness. And I just really love and believe in Beducated and I think it's something that everybody should have access to. So I'm very excited because one of the things I tell my clients all the time is that if you're gonna make a new year's resolution, it should be about adding something into your life rather than subtracting. And I think Beducated is the perfect tool to be adding a whole heap of pleasure into your life in 2024. So if you wanna do uh, less squatting and more squirting in 2024, <laughs> uh, click the link in my description and use my code Mickey Atkins. You can get 50% off of the yearly pass with that code. Um, Educated also has a one day free trial and a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you just wanna dip your toes in the water and check it out, I promise you will love it, but there's no risk involved. So go click that link, use my code Mickey Atkins, get 50% off the yearly pass and show Beducated some love for showing me some love. Thank you again to Beducated for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. As a nitpicky note, a lot of this Zoom call feels like somebody trying to pitch you an MLM. Like <laughs> it's very obvious that she prepared a speech and like uh, likely a PowerPoint or a deck of some kind. Um, and it really comes across like she's reading across uh, or reading off of it throughout this entire Zoom call. Um, and I also wanna draw people's attention to the fact that she marketed this event as like a sort of like girl power slumber party thing where you can connect with other like-minded women who are doing the same work as you and blah, blah, blah. Literally none of them were allowed to turn their mics on. She literally at one point in this mutes somebody who didn't have their mic muted. And it's just, it really comes across like Bethy wanting to have people look at her while she talks about something that she's not qualified to educate on. And again, I think it's clear by this point, but it is still an important point uh, to make that Bethany is just not equipped to be positioning herself as an expert or an educator in this topic. You get it, let's continue. A Christian woman, I think most people on here are either Christians or religious in some sort of way. Um, but for me, sometimes there can there can be like this lack of practical help in this area. Um, sometimes there can be statements like, and we're gonna talk about this, um, but statements like, oh, you just need to, you know, really have confidence, security in Christ, find your identity in him, and then you'll just be really able to show up. And, you know, you just need to know what God says about you. And although all of those things are true, and we are gonna talk about some of that, it can almost feel like there's something lacking, like, okay, but realistically, what does that look like? Like practically, what do I actually do to get to that place? I just wanna give you a spoiler real quick. She's not gonna give you the answer either. <laughs> doesn't give you any specific or actionable advice throughout this entire course. I actually took notes. Like I watched this more than once. And one of the watch throughs that I did, I specifically sat and took notes about any actionable advice that she gave you. I already mentioned this up at the front. I'll show you the clips of some of these things here in a second, but I wanna read you the list of actual, actionable, specific advice that she gives, again, that isn't buy my sex course or buy my PDF or, uh, you know, go listen to this podcast or search this on Google, literally. Uh, that's some of the advice that's given in this fucking uh, Zoom call. So of the actual specific advice that she gives, it's not those things. This is what she says. Uh, read the Song of Solomon. 
uh, which is a Bible, a book in the Bible. Think about fucking your husband more, um, which as she presents as like, essentially you can Pavlov yourself into wanting to fuck your husband. Change the tape that's playing in your mind. It's essentially like a reference to your internal dialogue, your um, monologue or self-talk. Masturbate in the shower or lay down and uh, have your own like sort of DIY porn where you relive positive sexual experiences. Uh, do your hair and makeup and wear outfits that your husband likes and buy lingerie from the thrift store and then wear it at home alone. That's the specific advice that she gives in this course, which again, I wanna be clear, all of this she's already given away for free as advice on her various social media platforms. But I think it's just important to point out here that none of this advice is actually useful when we're talking about developing sexual confidence, but rather when we're talking about greasing the works um, to make sex happen more often, right? And I think this is another thing to pay attention to. This is why I said I wanted to talk about this because I think she is presenting a lot of this advice behind closed doors with the hope that it won't get like evaluated um, in a public forum. Um, and I, I, there's a lot of discourse about like, is Bethany deconstructing? Is she becoming less severe or less of a fundy than some of the other like Christian fundamentalist counterparts? And in my opinion, no, because a lot of the advice, especially the advice that she's espousing behind closed doors um, and behind a paywall is geared towards making women more sexually available to men. Granted, Bethany does seem to have a spin about how to make this more fun for you, but more than once in this uh, Zoom call, she references how making sex more fun for you will mean that you are more likely to have sex with your husband which he will love. We're still very much framing this conversation from the point of view that sex is a necessary, is a non-negotiable, and is an obligation in marriage, and that women, if you just follow Bethany's six quick tips, uh, will learn how to uh, enjoy sex more, and so therefore you can meet your essentially Christian wifely duty uh, to have sex with your husband more often, which is super fucking harmful. <laughs> this is terrible advice, first of all, because it's not actually going to help anyone develop a sexual confidence, but it's also predatory. This is predatory and shitty advice because it's just repackaging purity culture in a seemingly more empowering package um, so that it seems more appealing and, and attainable, but still pushing the same message. Like, I hate this. I think that's clear. This is predatory and shitty and just fucked up advice. Okay, we're gonna talk about this section. She asks the participants to share in the chat why they're here, what they're hoping to gain out of this Zoom call. And then she offers up some information about herself and like what she's gained from sexual confidence. So we're gonna talk about that. Whenever that comes up, cause I really would love for us to, you know, for us to be able to, to have those more honest conversations with each other. Also, I don't know if Bethany doesn't know this, but you can't have a conversation when the other participants are muted. You're not wanting to have a conversation, babe. That's not what this is. And this is also not a connecting or interesting event for any of the people involved because they're literally not allowed to talk to each other. Like <laughs> That's super weird. You literally asked people to pay for a Zoom call so that you could mute them and talk at them for 90 minutes. If you wanna host a seminar, just say that. I'm just saying. So for me personally, um, I got married five years ago and I was 30 when I got married. So I'm 35 right now. Is that right? <laughs> I'm 35 right now. And for me, it's interesting because something that I have always felt that have, I guess has come easy to me in many areas of life is just confidence overall, probably to a fault, um, probably to the area where people are like, okay, you're annoying. Um, but just when it came to <laughs> life that I just felt like a very confident person, felt like I chose to do things that I was good at and even getting married, even though I had a lot of unanswered questions, I felt very confident in that. Um, going into sex, it's like, I felt confident even though I didn't really exactly know what I was doing. Um, but here is where things took kind of like a difficult turn for me. So when Really quick. She's going to talk about a point in her life where she wasn't confident. But before we do that, very much I want to highlight the fact that she has chosen to position herself as an expert on the topic of sexual confidence because I just have always been confident. And so therefore, I'm qualified to teach you how to gain confidence. <laughs> First of all, just, I doubt that. The nature of being a human being is experiencing insecurity and fear and feeling uh, out of place. That's just the way that life works sometimes. Everybody has insecurities or fears about something, but also, even if that were true, the fact that she's basically saying, I've never struggled with in this, and so therefore, not only am I better than you, but also I'm gonna teach you how to be like me is so, so 
gross and also a disqualifier. You are not qualified to teach anybody about anything if you just so happen to be lucky enough to be born with that gift. You have zero knowledge then about how to develop that, about how to curate that, about how to move past barriers or obstacles in order to achieve that. You have no experience in that, and so why should I trust you? You have no degree, you have no education, you have no certification, you also have no life experience, and you have no earthly concept, apparently, of what it feels like to be insecure or fearful or unsure about the co the topic of sex. So what are you doing here? What are we, What is this, then? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I'd like, be so serious, Bethany. When I got pregnant with my first, Davey Jr., he's like three and a half, almost four, and I have Audrey, who just turned a year, so I have two kids, and... When I had Davy Jr., my health was in a place where I had just been like really um, didn't understand how to really take care of my health. I thought I was healthy, but after working with some people, I was just like on the verge of burnout. And so when I had Davy, basically pregnancy just completely depleted my body and my body basically turned into like this sponge. It wanted to hold on to absolutely everything. So I like could not lose weight after pregnancy. My body just like held on to every single thing that it could. And I would just like look in the mirror and I'm like, who is this person? Like, I don't even recognize her. And I just felt like nothing that I normally would do that would work, um, worked. And I just, it was just so um, uncomfortable for me to feel like, wow, I really do not like the way that I look. I want to be careful about this because everybody is entitled to feel how they feel. And especially being an AFAB person, femme people, women, it's difficult to live in a world that objectifies you and that tells you that your value is first and foremost in your body and the way that you look, right? Fundy or not, nobody can really escape the societal pressure that comes along with that view. And so I sympathize with what she's saying here in the sense that she felt very not at home in her body after birthing a child, which like is a difficult thing to work through, um, you know, regardless of body image issues. But I want to, you know, honor that that's a difficult thing and to like express some empathy there. But I do also want to point out the fact that first of all, uh, the way that she describes this, you would assume that Bethy experienced um, a, a sudden and sharp and shocking weight gain that was, uh, you know, like an obvious red flag in regards to like, you know, what the medical community considers uh, determinants of health um, or things like that. And like, that's largely untrue. Uh, <laughs> truth, I actually checked, by the way, because I was like, am I misremembering? I actually checked. I scrolled back on her Instagram to see if she experienced some kind of like very obvious or shocking change to her body postpartum. And that was not the case. From the outside, if you're, especially if you're not someone who's hyper analyzing people's bodies, virtually unchanged, right? Especially because it's important to honor that while body dysmorphia is very much a thing that affects our mental health, um, there are also very real societal and social consequences that come along with being a plus size person who no longer fits into like the sort of straight size department store index of sizing. Um, and that was very much not Bethy's experience. So that's also worth noting here. Besides that, again, I wanna draw people's attention to the fact that she is acknowledging that the very first time that she ever felt insecure about her body as a grown woman or, or just as a person generally was at the age of like 33, 32, and that it had never even occurred to her to be insecure about her body before that point. Again, this is a disqualifier when we talk about somebody educating in regards to a topic that is actually very sensitive and like wrought with a lot of trauma for people as a clinician, um, especially one who has survived uh, more than one eating disorder um, and done the own, like my own actionable work around this issue, I feel very qualified to talk about how difficult and traumatizing and complex this issue is to navigate um, as a human being, but also educating around this topic. And so I'm very frustrated that she's choosing to position herself as an expert in this regard, when again, by her own admission, she has no concept of what it feels like to work through those insecurities or to have to be um, you know, combating uh, very real barriers that a lot of people face. I want to have like a great sex life. I want to have a great relationship, but how do I, like I can't just like hide in a closet from my husband and hide from myself. Like what the heck am I gonna do? And so I really had to come face to face with this idea of what does it mean to be truly confident and how can I still have like a thriving relationship with my husband, a thriving relationship with what I bring to the table um, during the season of working through my health and and getting um you know getting to a place where i physically am healthy from the inside out and you know losing 
losing weight, like all of the things, those of us who have been pregnant or if you've had a health struggle, you, you kind of know what that's like. And so for me, after having Davy, that was probably my lowest point of confidence because it was the first time that I really had to deal with uh, my body and my features in a way not looking the way that I necessarily wanted. I, again, just want to point out, there's several things that I want to point out here. First of all, again, I, I want to acknowledge and honor that everybody is going to experience trauma around their bodies, especially like people, again, we've already talked about this, who are being subjected to misogyny and that body dysmorphia is a very real thing regardless of your body size, right? You're, you're allowed to feel how you feel. However, Bethany presenting this experience as though she is such a brave warrior for overcoming a difficulty and an insecurity when like, again, the reality is that it's not like she experienced um, a, a sharp and sudden weight gain that caused, uh, you know, like the ire and and cruelty of, of her doctors and her medical team, which like, let's be clear, that's very much a thing that fat and plus size people face. Or also the social and societal shame that comes along with being a plus size person. It's not like she was no longer able to shop in department stores or buy clothes from most major retailers. Like really what we're talking about is that Bethy was just uncomfortable with her body. And again, that's valid and people are allowed to feel how they feel, but that's not, uh, this is not like the flex that she thinks it is. Um, it's also a very transparent view, I think, into how obsessed she is with the idea of thinness and being in a societally approved of body, regardless of all of her song and dance about how sexual confidence is not what you look like and it's not about your body, blah, blah, blah. She talks an awful fucking lot about her body and what she thinks an ideal body is in this course. And so I think that sort of betrays her. Erin just reminded me, I don't know if you guys heard that. Um, one of the things that she says in this clip is that uh, she wanted to have a thriving relationship with her husband, which again is just very much the Fundy take of like, if you're not hot and fucking your husband all the time that your marriage will be in the shitter. And that's not true, right? Not only is that a very um, misogynistic and like anti-empowering take for somebody who claims to be wanting to empower and, and improve the confidence of women, but this is also just like straight up not fucking true. The truth is that our relationships should be formed on a mutual understanding of trust and connection, shared uh, value and interest and love, affection, and not based solely in whether or not we're having sex with one another. I wanna point out that asexual people are real people who exist and have very valid and meaningful and healthy and intimate relationships in their own right. I doubt that, you know, Bethy is at all grieved about being uh, shitty to asexual people, but still it's important to acknowledge, um, especially because again, this is the point that I'm trying to make, which is that there is a lot of chatter about like whether or not she's becoming a more progressive person. And like, no, because she just admitted that her relationship with her husband would not be thriving, would not be good if she wasn't figuring out a way to circumvent her insecurity security so that she could just show up to have sex with the man. Never mind that she's going through an identity crisis and likely experiencing a lot of pain and suffering after, uh, you know, what is apparently a pretty traumatic childbirth for her. Never mind that. Fuck all of that. Like intimacy that we could have by being vulnerable about our emotions. Pfft, nope. We have to have sex with our partner. Otherwise our marriage is, is for shit and it's just not worth anything. Like this is so fucked up capture my thoughts and really say, no, this is what I want. This is how I want to feel. And so I am just going to act my way into feeling into what I want, even though I feel like I don't, okay, I don't necessarily love the way that my stomach looks in this lingerie anymore. I was like, you know what? It, that doesn't matter. Like what matters is that I'm going to put this on and the way I carry my body, the way I talk about myself, the way I allow myself to think about what I look like in the mirror is going to be the most important thing when I go into the bedroom or when I'm with my husband it, are those thoughts before that moment. And all of that work I did really did like transform the way that I thought. And I was able to truly be very um, exciting and very uh, excited about being with my husband, excited about lingerie, even though I had to go up sizes, whatever. And it was amazing. And so we're going to talk about how. You okay. I want, <laughs> I, I want to express empathy about the, the difficulty with the body stuff again, but it's just as a plus size person who's been on the receiving end of like first of all, literal death threats because I'm fat and dare to exist, uh, but also like a lot of medical discrimination and trauma and like very real societal discrimination and trauma. It's just really difficult for me to listen to a straight size societally approved of or a woman in a societally approved of body talk about how brave and transformative it is for her to just say, I'm choosing to not say mean things about my stomach. Like it's just, 
Okay, on top of that, I think the other thing to pay attention to here is that Bethany is essentially saying, fake it till you make it. Like that's her advice, which is just to pretend that you're a sexually confident person and that will eventually turn into confidence, which I guess has merit in some regards. But like, again, as a person who's positioning herself as an expert, this is like pretty lacking advice in my opinion. Okay, I wanna share this clip with you where she's sharing an anecdote um, about a conference that she and Kristen attended because she was really inspired by an older woman speaking about her sexuality. So we're gonna share that really odd anecdote with you now. We are sitting at our table and there's like a, I don't know, all these other speakers and authors and these people, some of them that I knew through, you know, whatever. And this lady, I don't even know why she started talking about this or like I, li I, I literally cannot remember the context of the conversation at all, but some of what she said just was, I had never really heard another woman say that like publicly and just so confidently and so proudly. And I was like, oh, like what? Um, this woman, she's like 70, not like not someone you would go, oh my goodness, look at her, like she's a babe. She was just very much kind of like grandma looking, you know, very much, um, you know, not in shape really at all. And so she, for whatever reason, the you see how I mentioned that I wanted to play this clip for you because of some other stuff. But also, do you see what I'm saying about how she's obsessed? It's very clear that Bethy is doing the thing that a lot of people who struggle with body image do, which is constantly comparing herself and her body to the body of everybody else in the room that she's uh, with but also constantly analyzing essentially like people's social capital, whether or not this woman uh, would be perceived as a babe or as like sexually active or sexually attractive, like really like sizing up people based on their appearances, which is not a fucking good sign. I think this is a morally neutral thing to struggle with. I wanna be super clear. This is very common. Again, misogyny, the society, uh, it sucks, right? We get it. And being an educator about a topic that's as sensitive, Ooh, I was gonna say special. And I was like, special is not the word, Mickey. As sensitive um, as sexual confidence, it's important that we be aware, first of all, of how the language that we're using might be fucking triggering to our participants. But second of all, that we've done the work on ourselves to be at least aware of and working on our own issues regarding body image and social power and social capital and all of these things, right? She seems to be really under the impression that she's fixed her issue with insecurity and, and like body image stuff because she just is sexually confident now. I have a sneaking suspicion that that has a lot to do with the fact that she lost weight until she feels comfortable in her body again. But again, this is not the person that anybody should be receiving education about sexual confidence from because she still, as a 35 year old woman, is doing the thing where she's comparing herself to, to the bodies of other people, which again is morally neutral, but does not provide you with a pulpit from which to preach about sexual confidence or uh, like an intrinsic feeling of, of at-homeness in your body. Conversation with the women at the table, I I have no idea, but she's standing there and she basically, the conversation, really quick. Also as an addendum, I want to point out that it's very normal and and like okay for people to struggle with this issue and to speak about that openly, right? I think the, there's an important distinction here in the sense that you can be an educator about these things and still struggle with this issue if you're being open about it, right? This would be a very powerful and transformative piece of, the word that's coming to mind is testimony because we're talking about religious uh, mumbo jumbo, but you get it, like a, a personal account um, to share that like, this is a thing that I still struggle with, right? This is a thing that I have struggled with from this time and here's how I worked through it and this is all of my experience with this. And in actively trying to work through this, I found confidence by X, Y, and Z, right? Like that's very relatable and I think actually very validating for a lot of people. There's no shame in honoring that we're still working through and struggling with an issue, but she's not even doing that. Like she can't even be honest <laughs> about the issue that she's struggling with. She's pretending that she is this holier than thou, uh, you know, fully healed, better than person and is therefore allowed and, and, you know, entitled to give people advice about their lives and their sexuality when the truth is that she's like bleeding all over her participants because it's painfully obvious to everyone in the room that she has a deeply seated insecurity about her body. This is, just, it's just like failing on all accounts and it's very frustrating to me happens and then she basically is like yeah well you know i might not have all the strongest muscles around my waist and i might you know she's like tapping her fat you know and she's like but i have muscles in all the right places and i know how to use them and she just starts going off on how like her husband he's so lucky to have her and all this stuff and she was absolutely hilarious but i just remember sitting there like 
what in the world? Like, you are the most random woman I have ever seen. We're at this biblical counseling conference that's supposed to be, like, all conservative. And here she is. And I was, like, cracking up in my head. And we were all kind of laughing. But I was so inspired by her because I'm like, wow, this woman who most people in the world would write off as, like, past her time of being like any sexual pleasure. And there she is talking about like, I might have a chunky stomach, but I have all the muscles in all the right places, literally like pointing down and just like, yeah, I know how to make my woman, my man happy, all this stuff. And it's like that, can you imagine? Like her husband is some sort of gramps too. And she's like, I got it going on, baby. It's like, that is an inspiration. And so many of us as younger women do not, go into the bedroom or even in private with that kind of mindset we're like oh, you know like oh, we just we don't bring that level of energy like I've got what it takes and my man's gonna be so satisfied he's married to me and it's like we focus so much on these externals and things that kind of like the world tells us are what matters and we kind of miss what actually matters and how to be actually super magnetic and enticing and I was just cracking up I just, <laughs> I'm really frustrated by this anecdote. A, because Bethany uses this as evidence that, see, even this big, fat, uggo, nasty old <laughs> woman can be sexually confident. So surely I can too. And like, first of all, really fucking rude. Like, fuck you for being mean to that lady because she didn't do anything wrong. Like, uh, do I necessarily agree with the take that like, it's okay that I'm fat because I have Gorilla Grip Coochie? Absolutely not. Like, that's not really like the answer to sexual confidence either, in my opinion. But I am still frustrated that Bethany is using this as an opportunity to essentially say like, see guys, we're young and hot. And if this old lady can, can get it, then so can I. Like, stop Stop it. Stop that because A, it's rude, but B, it doesn't provide anyone with actual useful education about this issue because essentially what you're saying is that just anytime you feel insecure, remember that, you know, big, fat, ugly old ladies are getting it too. Like that's not helpful. And again, this fuels the comparison thing, which from the research as a clinician, I can vouch for the fact that this regularly, uh, more often than not, is going to put someone in a, a place of greater insecurity, a place of, of further comparison and a uh, hypervigilance, like constantly evaluating and looking at and thinking about other people's bodies and their sexual attractiveness and all this stuff, rather than focusing inward. Like the work that we wanna be doing to build sexual confidence, <laughs> as a spoiler, I guess, is to be confident and empowered and at home with ourselves as people, right? Recognize that my partner or partners is a person who is lucky to be with me because I have value, because I matter, because I'm kind, because I'm funny, because I'm interesting, because I care about people, because I'm empathic, because I have cool hobbies, because I have cool hair, or like I have a, a, I don't know, neat hobby or whatever. Like I think I already said hobby once, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> we want to be viewing our worthiness through the lens of us as a whole person, rather than just viewing ourselves as like a piece of meat um, that at least I'm attractive and I'm not some old, nasty old lady. That's so rude. I just, again, I want to be super clear. The work in developing sexual confidence is in being confident in ourselves as a general person and being at home with our body. Confidence is not a thing that we do. It's not an act that we perform. It's a feeling that we have. And sometimes like a, an absence of a feeling really, like an absence um, of like hypervigilance or, um, you know, constant comparison that we have. And we're not going to develop that by telling people to essentially continue comparing yourself to people that you view as socially and sexually inferior to you, um, in, in order to make yourself feel better. Like that's not, that's not a helpful take, Bethany. And so I think that this woman is such a beautiful example of the mindsets that it takes to be super sexy, super magnetic in a way that has absolutely nothing to do with the way she looks and everything to do with the way that she thinks. And I think most of us would agree that the majority of men in this world, we'll just talk in ter generic terms, would be very excited if they're a woman we're like, oh my goodness, I, I can't wait to be with you. I know I have everything that it takes. I've got all the right parts, all the right muscles. I'm coming after you. If we would talk like that to our man, he'd probably be like, wow, yes, you know? Like most men would love that. And everything in that context has nothing to do with the way that you look, but everything to do with the way that you think about yourself. See how we just circled it all back to your husband will be really happy if you do this work? 
Ew. Okay, let's talk about this clip. Bethany is going to explain what she thinks uh, reasons that women are not confident or, you know, sexually uh, secure are. Um, and then she asks participants for their feedback, which obviously I'm not going to play you that. Super, super excited for you. Okay, so here are some of the reasons that I have heard from women of why they struggle in the bedroom or thoughts that I have had. And after I read these, I'm going to go back through and I read, want to read some of the posts that y'all have shared of just why you're here. Cause I think that's super valuable. Um, a big reason that we hear of why we can't be confident in the bedroom or a woman, you know, feels insecure is because she might say something like this. My body can't measure up to other women. Other women you see in movies, other women you see in magazines. And because of that, you're like, I'm never going to measure up. So how can I be confident? How can my husband be attracted to me when there's just like, you know, all these beautiful women around and access to all this beauty? Um, so that's a reason why women might struggle. Or I don't look as good as I did when I get got married. So comparing to a previous version of yourself and basically like, well, I'm not that. So how can I, you know, um, or this is another one that I have heard quite often, I feel silly wearing lingerie. So I feel silly when I put on sexy clothes. I just feel like, you know, dumb or just like a clown or just, uh, so I don't really do it. Or when I do do, do it, when I put on lingerie or try to look sexy, I just kind of like, um, you know, turn all the lights off or try to hurry up. And, you know, you just, you don't feel confident, um, even in the privacy of your own bedroom or, I just feel dumb when I try to be sexy. I try to do a sexy dance move. I try to look sexy and I just feel like so dumb. And he probably thinks I'm so dumb. So I'm just not even going to try. So a lot of women have reasons like that. And there might be one floating through your head right now. Like really quick, I just want to address the fact that I think part of the reason I take issue with his educating, I don't think I know. Part of the reason that I take issue with the way that she's speaking about this is because she presents the concept of sexual confidence as if it's like a performance almost. She views the ideal sexually confident woman as someone who's regularly wearing lingerie, someone who's regularly making um, advances or trying to seduce their partner in this very like movie, stereotypical like TV show kind of way. Somebody who is constantly looking for, wanting to have sex, and somebody who views their body as like sexual all the time. I think it's just really important to debunk this because that's not true. <laughs> sexual confidence is not about, again, like a performance that we're putting on. Ideally, when we talk about being confident in a sexual context, um, it's more so about being self-assured right? It's more so about having, again, like that lack of anxiety and the jittery and like the nervous. It's it's more so about feeling self-assured that I don't have to perform, right? I don't have to give a good lap dance or wear lingerie or feel like I can sort of strut around my house and be this very sexual and, you know, sort of like, <laughs> like um, a Hollywood caricature of a sexual woman because I know that I am desirable, because I know that I have value in myself and in my relationship. I know that my partner values me, my partner finds me attractive, my partner and I have a sexual relationship that works for us in a way that we both feel valued and empowered, and so I don't have to perform, right? Sexual confidence is not about doing extra, it's about feeling like you don't have to do extra. All of this advice that she's giving them is essentially how to fake being what a caricature in Bethany's mind of sexually confident is, and that's not fucking helpful. I think it's also worth noting that sexually confident will look different on everyone, right? I am not a person who's going to feel comfortable giving a lap dance or doing a sexy dance, mostly because I just don't really like dancing like that uh, in generally. Um, and so sexy for me looks different than somebody who like really enjoys moving their body in a sensual and sexy way, right? Like those two things can both embody sexual confidence, but they don't have to be the same for everyone. There's not a one size fits all answer for sexual confidence. We're fast forwarding. One of the other things I wanna discuss is that at one point in this course, she actually chastises one of her participants. Um, we're gonna tread lightly around this because I don't really wanna share any of the input that the participants had. A, because I think that's fucked up. They didn't ask uh, to be a part of Bethy's circus show, but B, because Bethy gives them a, an agreement of confidentiality. And while I don't agree with anything that Bethany does, I am going to honor that for her because again, the participants don't have anything to do with this. So at one point, Bethany does chastise one of the participants by telling them basically that like, you still need what I'm providing you in this course. And like, that might be nice that you think that you're doing well, but basically you're not. I am cutting out the section where Bethy reads verbatim the comment given by a participant. Cause again, I want to protect their privacy. Um, but the general context here is that a participant shared that their relationship is positive, that they're not coming to this course because of a deficit, but rather wanting to do like proactive work. Um, and they specifically mentioned feeling very validated by their partner. Um, this is Bethy's response to that. 
is so great. I mean, obviously having a husband that loves you and is like, you are the most beautiful, sexy goddess of a queen ever is great. Like, don't we all want to hear that? Like, wow, thank you. You know, like that makes me feel amazing. But like truly the confidence that I'm talking about should not be dependent on your husband telling you that you have like telling you you're a beautiful amazing sexy queen you know this should be something that apart from that like that is the cherry on top that is amazing but the confidence that I'm talking about is really something that you, that comes from within that you bring and then when he's like you're amazing you're all of these wonderful things you're like the best thing and he's just blown away it's like that is just like I said like cherries on top but it's not like your lifeline if if that makes sense uh, but it is always nice to have a husband who who does that. <laughs> okay, really quick. I don't necessarily disagree with the take that we want our confidence to come from within and to not be dependent on people's approval of us because we've talked about this before. If we are basing our identity and our self-worth in our approval or disapproval on from outside parties, that can land us in trouble pretty easily because that approval might be subject to change, right? That's not wrong. That's not bad necessarily. However, the fact that she is, first of all, chastising one of her participants by saying that's not what I'm talking about. Um, that's not the kind of confidence that you need to have is a really interesting take and like a very alienating piece of feedback to give. I think, again, this just really highlights the fact that Bethy has no formal credentialing or experience about how to be an effective educator because giving feedback around an issue like this can be so much more effective to say like, yes, that's ideal. You know, like wanting to do proactive work around something like this is really helpful. I think in addition to feeling validated by our partners, by feeling, um, you know, valued and seen and desired, we also want to make sure that we're doing that for ourselves, right? If we are already feeling situated and happy and validated in our relationships, then we can sort of shift focus to be like, how can I do that for myself, right? We want to make sure that we're forming a full picture of sexual confidence here so that we're not finding ourselves in a place where if he forgets to validate you or if that changes, right? Or if things, um, you know, go awry or whatever, um, that you're feeling left adrift and alone. Ultimately, we want to have that self assurance for ourselves. Like that's such a kinder way <laughs> to talk about this issue than to basically say, oh, like that's really nice. It also comes across as sour grapes. Like I don't want to be that guy, but it really does come across as sour grapes. Like Bethany saying, well, that's really nice for you that your husband likes you, <laughs> but the rest of us have sexual conference from within. So get on the same page, sister. And like, it's just very rude. And like, again, just further evidence, I think that Bethany is just not equipped to be an educator in the way that she's really tried to position herself. Okay, we're Fast forwarding again, I'm going to play you this clip uh, where Bethany is talking about the Song of Solomon um, because she thinks that this is very erotic, um, which first of all, I think is hilarious because one of the, the quotes from this section is that our rafters are made of pine, which like personally, I know that woodworking really gets my engine revving also. However, we're talking about this because Bethany upholds this as an example of like biblical proof that women are allowed to be... I don't know, like sexually voracious, but she uses really derisive language to refer to a very common behavior that a lot of people who are recovering from purity culture or just like sexual trauma generally will do, which is to withdraw. Um, so let me play you the clip and then we'll talk about it. It's worth reading and take what you like and get rid of what you don't like. Um, but when I turn to like scripture, I mentioned in the description, if you looked and read it online, that we were going to be talking about the bride and song of Solomon. Because to me, when I think of confidence in the bedroom, I really often think of her. And this isn't, don't worry if you're like, oh my goodness, this is just going to be like the longest Bible study. No, it's just, we're going to read some of the chapter. And I really, really think she is a beautiful example of just the mindset and the, like the outlook of what we as women should have as married women. So as I'm reading this, I just want you to think like, wow, is that how I act? Is that how I pursue my man? Is that how I think about myself? Are those the action steps that I take? Or am I the opposite, like shrinking and shriveling away? Um, so the Song of Solomon is a very fascinating... Again, we're, I'm going to let you listen to the rest of her babbling about the Song of Solomon, but this is another thing that I want to point out. Um, again, I've specifically not included feedback from the participants unless it's directly relevant or necessary to make a point about how Bethany is like fucking shit up right now. But it has come up um, that there are struggles that folks have had with eating disorders, body image stuff, and also purity culture recovery. So Bethany is well aware that the audience that she's speaking to um, is sensitive to those issues and she's still choosing to use this language about like shrinking and shriveling away and like using this really hateful <laughs> affect, which again is just worth pointing out. 
I feel very strongly about providing education that's uplifting and empowering and that normalizes our fears and struggles and insecurities and difficulties, right? Um, if you've been on the channel for any length of time, you will know that. And I just am really especially irritated by the fact that Bethany has chosen to try to educate about this issue and is like actively heaping shame upon people who have already struggled probably with a fair amount of shame um, in regards to their own recovery with particular issues. And so I just like don't understand and, and can't empathize with somebody who has such a se severe lack of awareness for the emotions and feelings of other people that she's speaking about her own, like the people who bought and paid for this course, she's speaking about them in this way that's very, very rude. I just like really don't relate to that at all. Book, And I will drop a link in the, um, in the uh, chat here. Let me see if I can find it really quick. All about... Um, Okay, if I can find this real quick, I'm going to drop it in the chat. But if not, then, oh, come on, come on, come on. Okay. Oh, wait. Okay, if I can find this, I'm going to drop it in because it's all about. Okay, right, here we go. Preparation. I'm going to drop this link in. It's a to random podcaster link, but you can look it up on their actual um, on their actual website. That link is to a podcast all about the Book of Song of Solomon with Dear Young Married Couple, which is an amazing podcast. And Really quick, we don't need to listen to the rest of this, honestly. Just want to point out that when you're selling a product or a course like this, professionalism is important. And listen, I'm not the person to yam on about professionalism. We've already talked on this channel about how I think professionalism is a colonial concept that most often is used uh, to pressure and coerce marginalized people into basically trying to embody what white cis hetero men think that business should look like. And like, fuck that, that sucks, right? I'm a therapist swearing um, and talking about squirting on the internet. So like, I'm, you know, not one <laughs> to really police people's professionalism. However, there's a difference between policing people's like personal affect and honoring that if somebody paid you money for a course that you've guaranteed is going to provide them with some kind of experience or training transformation or education of some kind that you at least have the fucking wherewithal to like, I don't know, have a fucking Word document with your relevant links that you're going to copy and paste in the chat since none of the participants are allowed to talk. Like this is not a difficult ask. This was 90 minutes, whereas she shared a couple of links in the, I think in total, there was three, four things that she put in the description. Like that's not a lot of prep work, girl. Like that's really not that difficult. I think I do more prep work for a fucking YouTube video and I'm not directly interacting with anyone. And so I just really don't respect the take that like, I'm going to take your money and also give you nothing, basically. I can't even give a shit about you enough, even though you've already paid me in advance to be here, to have my fucking Google links in order. Like, I just really do not respect this approach. Really quickly, I just want to play you this clip because I think it's hilarious. So um, please enjoy. Solomon and his bride delight in each other. And there is a lot of language in there. We don't know exactly what they're talking about, but this whole chapter so far is like very sensual and very erotic and very poetic. And, and you know, if we read into it, it's like, wow, they're having some very intense erotic conversation and she is really expressing what she wants. And then he has a bunch of stuff to say, but we're gonna jump down to her again. In verse 12, she says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me as a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. And then he goes on and responds, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And then she says, behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are our pine. And when I, I just, I, it's just funny. It's just funny. <laughs> I just wanted to include it as a little palate cleanser. Cause I think it's hilarious that this section where they're describing the color of their couch and the particular types of wood that their house is made of is Bethy's best example of biblical porn. All right, moving on. <laughs> okay, we're fast forwarding again. Cause this, uh, course is an hour and a half long. So I want to play you this clip and then we're going to talk about this. You're a creator. If you don't know like literally what your purpose is and your existence is on this earth, you're always going to be searching for it. You're always going to be looking to your man to give you worth and value. And that's something that he cannot give you. Nobody, even yourself, can give you one ounce of worth. You can't take it away. You can't add to it. That is something that God gives you through his love, through his grace, through his mercy, through Jesus, adopting you into his family as his daughter. Like that is something that is completely unearned. It's something you accept. Um, and so 
a lot of you probably know that and you're like, yeah, 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 I get to the other more practical stuff. But if you don't have that as your foundation, like you will always struggle in this area because you will constantly be looking to someone, something, some look, some goal oh, to give you that sense of worth that will eventually fail you because bodies eventually change age happens to all of us you know skin sacks pregnancy happens injuries happen sickness happens life happens we will never you know be youthful and and have this perfectly young body forever like age will eventually hap happen if you live to be 80 an 80 year old does not look like a 20 year old or 30 year old or 40 year old so it's like we have to have a sense of security outside of ourselves. So if you do not have a strong foundation, like a relationship with Christ, identity in him, that is something crucial to work on. And I know it sounds cheesy and cliche. And I know some of you are like, oh, but that really is so important. So I just want to encourage you to not neglect that and and to think like, I just need to get past that. I need to get to the good stuff. I just want to make sure that- Okay, I just want to point out that Bethy created this false equivalence here, this false assumption, wherein obviously uh, anybody who's not religious or doesn't prescribe to her very particular brand of religion um, places all of their self-worth in their physical self. And then eventually when their looks fade, um, and I think the subtext here being that you'll get old and ugly and fat, uh, which obviously that's the worst thing that anyone could ever be, that your sexual confidence confidence will fade, that you'll no longer feel confident or at home uh, in yourself or in your body, which is not true, right? That's a fallacy. The truth is that there are lots of people who don't prescribe to Bethy's very uh, particular and, and restrictive brand of religion uh, that place their value in their confidence and find sexual confidence and empowerment through the things that we've already talked about, right? Like feeling at home and empowered in your core personhood, having a relationship where you feel at home and you feel truly seen, you feel valued, you feel validated by your partner. There are like 3 million different ways that we can find assurance, confidence, empowerment in our bodies, in our lives, in our relationships that don't have to do with deity. And I want to be super clear, if you find uh, a sense of confidence or value or belonging in a deity, that's also super valid. But what's not okay is for you to say that other people who don't do that are wrong and therefore will always struggle with this area because that's not true. Uh, in the way that human beings are vastly different and complex and varied individuals, life is a very complex and vastly varied and different uh, series of experiences experiences and relationships and, and lives. And we'll all find our own way through the universe that works best for our unique selves. And that's okay. We should give people the fucking permission and, and like the out to do that because ultimately it doesn't fucking concern you. It doesn't matter to you how other people find their sense of assurance. So long as we're staying in our own lane, we're giving ourselves permission to do that. And we're just minding our own homework. Okay. Before we talk about this next bit, I just want to remind you, if you haven't yet, go click the link in the description, get 50% off your annual pass using code Mickey Atkins. Thanks again, Beducated. Okay, number two, you have to change the tape playing in your head from, okay? So whatever your tape is, I'm gonna give some, but I want you to think, what is the tape that you have that plays in your head that keeps you from being this confident woman in the bedroom? And this is what you have to change. So you have to change the tape playing in your head from, I'm dumb, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I don't look the way that I used to. Um, there are girls that are so much prettier, than whatever it is. Like you have to change that tape that's constantly playing in your head that shows up all the time that you allow. Those thoughts are not, they don't have to be there. Like these are thoughts that you allow and you choose to let play in your head over and over again. And they have such a huge impact on you and on your marriage and the way that you experience intimacy, the way that you experience sex in the bedroom, like those tapes that you let play in your head, they have such a huge impact on you. So don't just go like, oh, like, I just can't help it. I just, it's just the way I am. Like, no, like you have to take charge of what you think. Like you have to, I mean, we're getting in biblical terms. It's like take whatever. Nobody cares about the biblical terms. Um, I want to point this out because again, I think this is one of those moments where because it's not being publicly shared on the, you know, World Wide Web, Bethy felt allowed to be uh, the worst version of herself here. And I just want to be super clear. Besides the fact that this is really fucking mean, it's also not a flex as an educator to be mocking the people that you're supposedly educating. We talked about this earlier, but this mocking tone that she uses when she talks about like, 
oh, you did to me that like that sucks. That's super shitty. And also, that's true. It is a very difficult thing that people struggle with that sometimes we truly don't have control over. Intrusive thoughts are intrusive because they intrude into our mind against our will. The the fancy therapy word or like uh, you know therapy language that folks use when we talk about intrusive thoughts, specifically related to OCD, but like generally speaking, is that they're ego dystonic. This is a fancy therapy way of referring to the fact that these thoughts fly in the face of our values and beliefs. Ego in like the Freudian sense, meaning like our sort of regulatory inner body, right? It essentially refers to the phenomenon that a lot of folks who struggle with intrusive thoughts, with particularly serious or, or chronic anxiety, will have these intrusive thoughts that are centered around our deepest insecurities, our fears, um, feelings of uh, frustration or shame that we have about ourselves. And they often, again, fly in the face of our values and beliefs, and they're very difficult to control as a person who struggles with intrusive thoughts and also has done a lot of clinical work with folks who struggle with anxiety of this type. I can personally vouch for the fact that this is not something that you're choosing to allow. Sometimes it is very much your mind and your brain doing the thing where it's sort of rebelling against you and it's, it's doing brain things. Things, right? We've talked about before um, how essentially our brain is like an electrified meat sack that lives inside of our skull. And while it's very sophisticated in a lot of ways, it's a really advanced piece of technology that's like honestly kind of incredible. It's also really fucking dumb sometimes. <laughs> this is the difficulty with having such a highly evolved brain is that sometimes it works uh, in a way that's very intuitive, that's very impressive, that's very evolved. And sometimes it's reduced to its core reptilian survival instincts, um, which, you know, backfire or misfire sometimes. I really take issue with, first of all, Bethy mocking her participants, but second of all, this take that you uh, are choosing to allow, for example, thoughts about your insecurities or fears to ruin your relationships. Because like, first of all, holy victim blaming Batman, but second of all, that's not how it works. This is why people who are not educated about psychology and the brain and mental health should not be educating about psychology or the brain or mental health. Ugh. Okay, we're fast forwarding again past some participant stuff. Um, I want to show you this clip. Husband and then throughout the day leading up to that. But it would make such a huge difference in your life if you took ownership and charge and directed what you allowed yourself to meditate on and think about, not only about what happens in the bedroom, but also about yourself. Um, and I've shared this really quick. That's not true. <laughs> I know that thought stopping and like cognitive reframing and restructuring is a common technique in certain CBT modalities. And I am not here to shade or shame or judge other therapists who use CBT. I've talked about it before on the channel. Maybe I'll make a dedicated video about CBT. If you want me to talk about that, leave it in the comments. Personally, I'm just not a fan because it's very directive. It's very top down in terms of its like authority structure. Um, and it also tends to trivialize and manualize what is actually a very complex issue for, for folks in regards to, again, intrusive thoughts, but also like uh, deep seated insecurities and traumas, right? If, for example, I am a person who has survived purity culture and I have persisting fears and insecurities and shame about my sexuality because I've been taught my entire life that sex is bad, intimacy is bad, lust is bad, uh, seduction is sinful, you'll go to hell, eternal hellfire, it will never be the same again, God sees you, and I'm experiencing a difficulty with engaging sexually, you can't just tell me, think differently about it, and then you'll feel better. That's not how it works. Uh, in one of my more recent videos, there was a ton of comments from folks who talked about how using CBT or, or being subjected to CBT in the early part of their therapy journey was not effective in treating their chronic trauma or, or CPTSD symptoms. But as soon as they started things like somatic therapy, EMDR, anything else that was like particularly centered on like our bodies and our uh, somatic experiences that they experienced a whole lot more relief that way. That's not a coincidence. You're also not alone in that. That's a very common experience for folks. And this is because CPTSD, deep-seated trauma, deep-seated insecurities are not just us thinking poorly. It's not as simple as just telling your brain, think differently and it will be better. It doesn't work that way. Again, our brains are very evolved and complex pieces of like essentially technology. But in a lot of ways, we have to remember they're also very deeply and intrinsically connected to our bodies. Our central and sympathetic nervous system function in tandem to create a, a whole body experience. And so, for example, this is why for a lot of people, like Aaron is the perfect example of this. The smell of sunscreen for Aaron is like an immediate mood boost. He loves the smell of sunscreen. And it's because that he has a lot of positive memories that are associated with sunscreen. There are 
parts of his childhood that were particularly impactful, uh, particularly like life-giving and empowering. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the smell of sunscreen is a very powerful way to prime his body to be in a happier mood. This happens in reverse also, right? And so if you have a very strong association with sex, for example, it's a very common experience that our partners will touch us in a particular way, that they'll uh, talk to us or approach us or behave in a particular way when they're interested in sex. And that experience, like noticing those behaviors, that feeling of touch, um, any of those somatic things can prime your body to experience a trauma response. And so just telling you think differently about it isn't going to do dick all for the fact that your body is like danger 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 this is so scary I'm dysregulated you can tell your brain to do what you want it to do all day long but if your body's not on the same page it does not matter how many times you try to say take your thoughts captive take your thoughts captive take your thought that's not how it works that's not how it works and it's not an effective intervention and it's also super fucking dismissive to people who've struggled such a difficult or, or survived such a difficult and traumatizing event um, or like series of events really um, in being told their entire lives that their bodies are dangerous, that their sexuality is sinful, um, that what is actually a very normal human desire will send them into eternal hellfire. Like you can't just think your way out of that, Bethy. Oh, also I want to point out too, again, uh, I know I'm like really harping on the fact that Bethy's not a qualified educator, but it's because she's not. I also can't think of a faster <laughs> and more efficient way to completely fucking annihilate your, your rapport that you've built with any of these participants up to this point than by mocking their experience and having difficulty with rewiring their brain to just think differently about what could very much be a deeply traumatic and life-changing experience for them. I'm like, hello? Anybody who's an effective educator is never going to do the thing where they mock and make fun of the very people who have just paid the money to be, you know, participating in this event. Okay, let's keep watching. It's on Instagram, so if you follow me, you've seen this, but... I was reading a book. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a sex therapist couple. And they were talking about that, like how we didn't want to look that up. You didn't want to fact check that before you got here. Hello? One of the biggest things that can make like a massive difference immediately is literally just changing what you think about during the day in the context of yourself and in the context of what you want in the bedroom with your spouse. So if you are like, oh, I'm so tired is this going to be so hard? Is this going to be like, just like, you know, same old, same old, um, he doesn't know what I want. Or is this going to be like, you know, is, is whatever worries, or you're just like, huh, I don't, I don't know. Like, should we, you know, whatever. And if you change that to like, you know what? I would, I want to have an amazing time tonight. I want to try something new. I want to, I want to do something crazy or I want to go and pursue him or I'm going to start, I want to send him a sexy text right now. If you start changing and start thinking about him throughout the day, thinking about maybe some of the best experiences you've had with him, a kiss that was so amazing or a touch and the, just the meaning that it had in your life, or just even maybe a really special date you had or your honeymoon, positive experiences you've had together sexually. And you start thinking about those throughout the day you are literally like changing the experiences you're going to have in the future based off of what you are doing right now. And if you really get in tune with yourself, and again, these are things that not all Christians feel comfortable talking about, but it's like it's the nitty gritty. When I talk about like you want to basically take ownership of the way that your body responds and how you get turned on and all of that. Yes, your husband obviously has a huge part in that, but like if you are not showing up and bringing that like... The, the, those positive tapes into the bedroom with you like he can rub you until the cows come home and it could be very difficult because you are just mentally like oh I don't have what it takes blah 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 all of that he can rub you until the cows come home is not a phrase that I had on my bingo card for 2023 but I guess we really squeaked that one in at the last second thanks for that Bethany on top of that she's implying here that the onus of sexual satisfaction is on the female partner essentially to the tune of like just Pavlov yourself into being aroused by having sex with your husband by doing this like DIY porn thing she speaks about this a lot where she refers to just sit down and think about any positive experiences that you've had with your husband which like, first of all, if thinking about positive sexual experiences that you've had is like becoming a full-time job to the degree that like you need to do this in order to be willing to be intimate with your partner, 
we have a problem. Like we have a greater issue that we need to discuss here because no one should have to try this hard. And if you are having to try this hard in solitude, then we should be having a conversation about how can we as a couple work through this issue, right? Because I do want to be clear, it's very normal for people to go through fluctuations in libido, fluctuations in, um, frequency with sex and intimacy in a relationship. I will be the first person to own that I, you know, in recovering from surgery and all of that have not been in a place to be sexual with my husband and that's fine, right? But we have had a collective conversation as like two human beings who are in relationship with one another about like, how can we make sure that we're still feeling seen? How can we make sure that we're still feeling connected? What are things that you need from me? What are things that I need from you? These are the kind of conversations that we wanna be having when we're struggling with an issue like this rather than just saying, Saying, the onus is on you to just DIY your own highlight reel of like your best sexual moments so that you can come to the bedroom already aroused so that your husband doesn't have to do anything. Like the subtext here is very much like you need to prep yourself before you walk into this bedroom knowing full well that your husband expects to have sex with you tonight because he can't be bothered to... I don't know, be a caring partner and to give a fuck about the fact that you have responsive desire and to incorporate time and attention into your intimacy to make sure that you have time to build up to arousal rather than than just trying to force this uh, sequence of events or like the speed of this event in a way that works for him. Like that's not loving also, but it's also not helpful. Like this is not helpful fucking advice. If somebody is genuinely struggling to experience a desire in their relationship or a, a, an openness to sex or intimacy, again, this is under the premise that you're a person who values sex and wants to have sex in your relationship in the first place. But if you're struggling to this degree, using all of these life hacks in <laughs> solitude is not the answer. The, the truth is that we need to be having a collaborative conversation about whoever is in this relationship, what we need to be doing to feel seen, to feel connected, and also sexually what we like, what we're interested in, what is arousing to us, right? I've talked on the channel before about responsive versus spontaneous desire. This is very much uh, life-changing advice <laughs> for some folks, but it's very common for usually AFAB people um, to experience responsive desire where it's rare to just sort of be like walking down the street and experience like a, like a lightning bolt of like, I wanna have sex right now, but rather like a carefully placed touch or like a really long kiss or slow buildup to intimacy. People with responsive desire are much more receptive to those kind of gradual like on-ramp types of intimacy um, and will oftentimes find themselves in a place that they're like ready to be aroused if they're being provided with like stimuli essentially. And so it's very helpful if you know you're a person with responsive desire to communicate this to your partner so that your partner can say, awesome. The next time, like if I experience spontaneous desire, I know that what we're not gonna do is say, let's have sex right now, what I'm gonna do is first of all say, are you open to me like coming on to you right now? And if you're not, that's fine, right? We should respect that always first and foremost, which also seems to be a key missing piece of advice from all of Becky's education. Um, but second of all, that if you are open to me coming on to you, that we're gonna do that slowly. I'm gonna ask some questions obviously beforehand um, about what you're into, about what's arousing to you, about what feels good to you. And we're gonna build in some time to slowly work up to arousal together so that when we ultimately get to the place of having intercourse, again, if that's even what matters to you, um, that we're both feeling ready, validated, seen, heard, connected, rather than just trying to force it. I don't even know how I ended up on a tangent about responsive versus uh, spontaneous desire. But the point that I'm making is that Bethy is like so sorely lacking in the understanding of this that she's basically just trying to teach women how to like DIY the situation in solitude away from their husbands. And that's not the answer. Like there's no world where that's the fucking answer. Um, if you start thinking like, a, you know, a challenge would be like, okay, maybe tomorrow or tonight you for five to 10 minutes, you just think of one of the best sexual experiences you and your husband have had. Even if it's like not full on intercourse, maybe it was kissing, maybe it was a really amazing date you had. <clears throat> maybe it was um, a touching in a certain way. I also want to point out that as somebody who's trying to, or she's somebody who's trying to position herself as an educator about sexual topics, not once in this course have we used anatomically correct terms to refer to anybody's body parts. If we want to have conversations, frank and open and destigmatizing conversations about sex and intimacy, we need to familiarize ourselves with the anatomical and correct names for our body parts. And also to be specific, like for, for somebody who uh, at the beginning of this course was like, 
like, you know, people are so vague and nobody gives specific instruction. Not once has Bethany referred to anything specific or actually useful about this, right? Like if we are really committed to this bit of like trying to guide people through remembering their most pleasurable or arousing sexual experience with their partner, but you're not able to specifically say like, oh, remembering the last time that your partner touched your vulva in this way or remembering like, you know, clitoral stimulation is something that I really value. So think about the last time that your husband like went down on you or, you know, stimulated your clitoris in a way that was really pleasing. Like we we're not having those conversations. She basically is doing like the adult equivalent of saying like, when he touched you down there, which is juvenile and so sad and embarrassing and also not helpful, right? This is not illuminating or helpful, especially for people who are more likely to have not experienced frank and open conversations about frank and open conversations about body parts. It's important that we be including education about body parts and about specific sexual acts that might be arousing or interesting or helpful if you're supposed to be educating about that. Don't make fun of me. I was like, maybe that one's passable. And I was like, no, no, I don't think it is. You know, whatever that that experience is and you just allow yourself for like 10 minutes to really just like meditate on that and think about that and enjoy that and notice how your body responds as you do that notice you know literally how you are getting turned on um, because of these thoughts that you're having and imagine if you started doing that more often how you would feel and how you would experience intimacy with your man as compared to the opposite constantly pushing away closing off closing up or you know, just, just being like busy and going on with your day. Just being busy. <laughs> So I'm so annoyed by the assumption that people are not experiencing arousal in regards to having sex with their spouse because they are just sitting around all day thinking these deeply resentful thoughts, which first of all, if you are, that's very valid. Everybody experiences difficulties in their relationship, but the the goal or the, the fix for that is to talk about it to your partner because if they're not making you feel seen, they should do something to make you feel seen rather than you trying to just think about the last time that you had sex with them and that will fix it, but also, the, the truth is that a lot of the people in Bethany's niche are people who are married or partnered um, and have children, have competing responsibilities, have jobs, have things that are vying for their time and attention. And so of course it's difficult for them. Rarely, if ever, are people just like at work or like driving to the dentist or like, you know, orchestrating like a, a kitty play date and having time to like relive your highlight reel and be aroused at daycare. Like that's super fucking weird, Bethany. That's super fucking weird advice and also just again, not helpful. This really comes from the assumption that like people are just sitting around, these women are just sitting around with nothing else to do all day, but think about fucking their man. And like, that's not true. That's not true or helpful advice. Who is this helping? challenge you to do and that starts with those tapes that you play in your head and exchanging them for really really positive ones okay also just as an addendum if we created a greater feeling of equity in relationships if we were actually sharing the mental load equally in relationships where one partner wasn't consistently shouldering the emotional logistical burden of planning for kids of cooking dinner of maintaining a house of going to work of doing all of the the situating and things that oftentimes people who are subjected misogyny have to do then there would be a lot more space for people to be open to intimacy and to sex with their partner because they weren't feel they wouldn't be feeling overwhelmed and exhausted and run the fuck down all the time. They also wouldn't be perceiving their partner as a child who needs caretaking if their partner would be an adult who didn't require caretaking. Like th this is a, a relational problem that needs to be addressed rather than just trying to teach women about how to masturbate, but it's not called masturbating, so it's totally different and therefore you'll feel better. Like that's Another thing you can do to become a truly confident woman in the bedroom is to take ownership of your own sexuality and stop waiting for him to make you feel sexy. And I know this might be kind of controversial, but I really firmly believe this. Take ownership of your own sexuality and stop waiting for him to make you feel sexy. So you bring sexy into the bedroom. Huh? You don't wait for him to like make you feel a certain way in order for you to be able to show up confident. You are doing practical things beforehand, like we just talked about, to bring that sexy mindset into the bedroom. And anything he says, anything he does that's positive on top of that is just the icing on top, okay? But you are setting yourself up for being a sexy woman without needing him and his 
uh, him being like, oh my goodness, you're so amazing. You look this way. Like, okay, I guess, I guess so. Okay. I guess I can kind of get turned on here. I guess I can get excited about this. Like, no, you're doing that kind of like beforehand. And it becomes almost like a way of life and a way of thinking. Um, so practical things you can do before. <laughs> Bethany describing this as a way of life is hilarious, first of all. But second of all, this is not an okay norm to perpetuate in relationships. Like this is just another thing that Bethany has heaped upon the, the pile of fucking emotional labor that women in these partnerships have to do, where not only are you full-time mom, not only to your kids, but to your partner, but you're also the chef, you're the logistic or the, the logistics manager, you're the travel booker, you're the cleaner, you're the cooker, you're the the thinker, the organizer, the grocery shopper, the list maker, but now also it's your fucking job to, to basically turn yourself on, have sex with yourself so that your husband can just show up and get it in for a few minutes so that he doesn't have to work at it. Cause poor guy, you shouldn't have to try. Like, hello? This is insane. Like this is so, this is what I was talking about when I said at the beginning, I think Bethy gave herself a write off to put some of her most rancid advice behind a paywall because we're really saying the quiet part out loud here, which is that men Men should not be responsible for any aspect of their relationship. Men in Bethy's mind should not be responsible for maintaining, for um, like maintenancing any part of their relationship or their partner in any regard ever. And if your marriage is going to be successful, it's your job as the woman to make sure that everything functions exactly the way that it should. And if it doesn't, then that's your fucking fault. Try harder, do more, pay more attention, give it more emotional labor, take another course, buy another PDF, do another seminar. How is that fair? Like, that's not fair. And it also is not going to work. Like, I think that's the important subtext here also is that it does not matter how hard you try. You can take all of the courses and read all of the books and watch all of the podcasts and masturbate in the shower as many times as you want to, but that's not going to fix the fact that if you're in a marriage where your partner doesn't give a fuck about you enough to maintain your relationship and to fucking show up for you, that you're going to consistently feel unseen, uncared for, not valued, and not sexy. There's nothing that you can do as an individual to carry a relationship where two people should be active and participating partners. And also, that's not your job. Like this is not an okay norm to, pre to be perpetuating beforehand, like throughout the day or before you're even together with him in the room um, would be, you know, it's maybe you take like a really nice slow shower, even if it's just for like 10 minutes and you really, t you know, think and just like celebrate different parts of your body that are God designed, that are sensual and beautiful and the parts that you just are like, yes, like I have what it takes. Like, thank you for this part of my body. Like, I am so excited that, you know, and just work through different parts of your body. That can be a really beautiful practice as well. And just like, you know, even not being afraid of your body and not being afraid to, you know, see your body and look at your body and celebrate your body. Um, all of that can be super, super valuable. It may look like you know, taking a, taking time to rest, like taking, you know, 30 minutes and just like laying down and thinking about the kind of experience you want to have with your husband, not putting all these expectations on it, but just the kind of woman you want to be that evening. And, and just like the beauty that you want to experience, the intimacy that you want to experience and getting yourself in a headspace that is ready to be open and to be vulnerable. If you have any, you know, um, like blocks in your heart going into intimacy. Like it's going to be really hard to have a truly intimate, beautiful time if you are like already having like small walls that go up. So taking some time beforehand to really work through that or to transition if you work or if you're a busy mom, take- Right, because busy moms, working moms, the thing that they have most abundantly is time to take an extra shower in a day and then lay in their bed for 30 minutes and think erotic thoughts about their own body parts. That is the thing that they have the most abundant resource of, which is time alone to be in the nude and trying to be sexual with yourself. Definitely, you're, they're not gonna have issues with their kids bursting through the door and being like, mom, mom, where are you? Where's dinner? With their partner being like, oh, where's your laundry? How come nothing got done today? Definitely, that's not gonna be a problem at all. Good advice, Bethy, thanks for that. Really life-changing. Jesus fucking Christ. We're fast forwarding past this rancid ass shit. Another thing that you can do to really help you be the confident Christian woman in the bedroom yeah. is to start dressing, talking, and acting like the woman you want to be 
and not the woman you don't want to be or the woman that you are. So a lot of us, when we're unhappy. Hello? Remember when I said earlier that Bethy really equates sexual confidence with a performance and like basically being not who you are? We said it out loud. <laughs> she said one other thing that you can do is to start dressing, talking, and acting like the woman that you want to be rather than the woman that you are or the woman that you don't want to be. Huh? <laughs> Girl, what? This is, first of all, the least empowering fucking advice that I've ever heard, which is not going to lend itself to confidence at all, because basically what you just told all of these participants is that the way that you are is not good enough. Don't be her. Gross. You don't want to be her. Be some other different, aspirational version of yourself. That's not helpful. <laughs> That's not helpful. That's also not a realistic expectation to achieve all the time, especially for people in this niche who are likely busy moms, working moms, people with competing responsibilities. Again, this is not a realistic goal. Just be someone else, basically. That's how you achieve sexual confidence, according to Bethany, is just don't. Just don't be yourself. Be someone else. Neat. With kind of how we look or how we feel about ourselves, sometimes we tend to like hide or just like nothing's ever going to change. So we just kind of stay the same. But I would encourage you to start dressing and it doesn't have to be like, oh my goodness, now you're just, you know, showing your boobs off. I'm not talking about that. But like, it might, you might just put a little bit of effort. Like I'm going to do my makeup today. I'm going to start doing my hair. I'm going to start like when you get ready and you start feeling good about yourself, it honestly changes like for women, it changes the way you carry yourself. It changes the way that you walk throughout the day. So like when I do that, when I put on an outfit that I feel good in that I like, when I do take the time to do my makeup or do my hair or whatever those things are for you. Like for me, I love to get my nails done. Um, you know, whatever. It could be something different for you. You know, it might be like taking a shower in the morning and like getting all clean and shaving, whatever. That can make you feel really good. Like it could look different for each one of us. But taking the time to start dressing talking and acting like the woman that you want to be. Basically, this section of the course boils down to uh, these are things that I do that make me feel good. And so therefore, it must be true in everyone else's experience, which is, again, a fucking red flag when we talk about educating. OK, there's also a section of this where she talks about a country song that her husband really likes. And so apparently that's useful advice. I don't know. Um, she basically just outs this song by Luke Bryan as being number one on her and Dave's sex playlist, which is functionally useless advice in my opinion. Um, and then she asks the other participants to give each other fucking advice, which like the incompetence train keeps rolling. Uh, Bethy ran out of things to say, I guess. So we're just asking the participants to educate each other. Okay, this is sort of a sensitive area that I want to proceed with caution around too because there is a comment that's made that I think is particularly poignant and like really relevant to a lot of the criticism that Bethany has received about her sex educating. But again, I want to guarantee that these people are not being, um, you know, put in this video. I don't necessarily even want to share like specific things that they've said. Um, so I'm just gonna summarize briefly for you what the criticism was, and then I'll show you Bethany's response. Okay, so again, I'm gonna paraphrase this, um, but essentially there's a question posed about whether or not it's actually helpful to try to force yourself to be aroused or interested in sex. Uh, and the person shares um, about their own history, which I'm not gonna share, but the person shares that basically to them, trying to force themselves to be in the mood, like following all of Bethany's advice up to this point doesn't seem like it's gonna be a good idea and asks Bethany whether or not this is actually a good idea or whether it's reinforcing purity culture values. Um, it's a very well-worded comment that again, I'm not including because I want to assure this person's privacy, but it's, it's a very poignant and well thought out and very intelligent question um, that's posed in a very kind and respectful way. And this is how Bethany responds. I think we're talking about two different things. I think that you and like, personally, I, like my husband and I, we very much believe like intimacy and sex. It's like, like he doesn't want me to give him like sympathy, like servicing him like a car. And I don't want that either. That's like just trying to like get body parts to do a certain thing. And that's not really true intimacy. So I'm not um, talking about that at all. And I think a lot of that between you and your husband comes from having truly open and honest conversations. And again, I know I keep pulling this up. You're going to get this. I would really encourage you. Like I really, really encourage you and your husband to start working through the hundred questions because I think that this will bring up some of these um, crucial conversations that y'all need to be having about when you want to have sex, how you want to have sex, the type of sex you want to be having. Because let's be real, like, you know, however often you have sex, 
it doesn't always look the same. Sometimes you're like, that was out of this world, just physically crazy. Sometimes you're like, wow, that was really meaningful and really connecting. Sometimes you're like, you know, I just, I feel so close to you. Or sometimes you're like, you know, one is like, that was amazing for me. And the other one's like, for some reason, it just wasn't as great for me today. Whatever. Like we get it. Sometimes you schedule sex. Sometimes you don't. So it's, I'm not saying that it always looks the exact same, but what I'm talking about is more like that, that whole mindset of how a lot of us think about sex, think about ourselves, think about our bodies throughout the day. And we don't realize how directly that fuels why we may or may not want to have sex in the evening. So if your tapes that you're playing are like, okay, well, sex is something for him. How am I going to get myself in the mood to service him? Like, of course, that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about you being a woman who's like, I know I deserve pleasure. This is what I want out of marriage. This is what I want out of this sexy time. And I'm going to start thinking in that mode. And when both of you bring that to the table, when both of you are like, wow, we're going to have an amazing time tonight together, it can be so incredibly intimate and beautiful. But if you don't believe that is the kind of sex that you're capable of or that you really do, it does seem like it's more of a servicing or more about him. Those are conversations you really need to have because true, beautiful, intimate sex should be about both of you and should be about the pleasure of both of you. Um, but again, if you are playing these tapes and if your marriage is in this dynamic of it's more about him, you're just kind of there to meet his needs, then I can see why your body would be shut off and you wouldn't really want that. So you kind of have to rewind and figure out how you can create intimacy that is worth desiring. So if your intimacy is not worth desiring all the time, I would say like really that is something important to work on. It it kept getting worse. I was going to pause it and it, it just keeps fucking getting worse. To recap, the question was, isn't it kind of coercive to force myself to be interested in sex when I'm not. It, that seems kind of purity culture-y. Don't love that. Don't feel good about that. And Bethany responds by basically saying, you view sex as servicing your husband like a car. You guys don't have intimacy that's worth desiring. You view sex as an obligation. And so, of course, your body is shut off, probably because you're having bad sex, basically, is what Bethany's advice is here is to shit on this question. First of all, to not address this question at all. We're not at all even acknowledging that like, yes, this is actually a very purity culture oriented belief, which is that if you just change the way that you think about sex, then therefore you'll be interested in sex. And ultimately having sex is always the goal. Not gonna address that at all. Basically, I'm just gonna insult you. I'm gonna insult this participant and say, I understand that your body is shut off because you guys probably just don't have very good sex and you're thinking about it all in the wrong way and that's not what I said. Anyways, moving on. I just really, again, I'm frustrated because I want to share with you guys like the actual question that was asked because it is so incredibly well-worded and like succinctly and intelligently put, but I'm not gonna do that and I just, it just really highlights the disparity here <laughs> between um, even the people that Bethany is trying to educate and the way that Bethany speaks and, and conducts herself about this issue. It just really highlights the fact that she is so woefully fucking ill-equipped to be positioning herself as an expert or even like a mentor in regards to this issue because she has no meaningful fucking advice. And when held to task in like the kindest and most compassionate way, she like shits the bed immediately. It's just very frustrating and disappointing pointing to me, especially because this kind of issue is, again, very, very traumatic for a lot of folks. It can be tied to a lot of deeply traumatic experiences and memories, and we should really be conducting ourselves with an attitude of care and compassion so as to not accidentally trigger or hurt or further wound anyone. And like, you, like you would not know that Bethy is even aware that those are traumatic issues because she just breezes right on past and refuses to acknowledge it. And it's just, it's not surprising, but it's still really fucking disappointing. The last thing in this course um, is somebody asking uh, for advice about a particular thing. It's, it's irrelevant what the advice is about, but they ask for advice about a particular thing. And Bethy actually recommends, just search Pinterest, just Google it basically, <laughs> it's her advice which is horrifying. To her credit, uh, Bethy does affirm that your body currently is like worthy of, uh, you know, love and like being celebrated. Um, she does encourage people to not idealize like a goal body or a goal weight or a goal figure or whatever, um, which like the bar is in hell. It's so low, <laughs> but I did want to give her credit where credit is due. She does at least tell people to not idealize this future version of themselves because they're worthy of pleasure now. So like, 
fair enough, I guess. But generally speaking, there is absolutely nothing in this course that first of all is new um, or like novel, um, but second of all, worth repeating or worth uh, prescribing to people as advice. If anything, these were just more fringe and more obviously purity culture leaning beliefs that she gave herself the out to share because it's behind a payroll. And I just, again, I really wanna point this out to people because it's just, disappointing and <laughs> frustrating how much of a write-off Bethy has given herself to be labeling herself in this very, you know, particular way about like, I am a sex educator and I know all this stuff and I'm changing the game for Christian women. And like, literally, no, you're not. You're not. You're parroting <laughs> advice that comes directly from purity culture. And anytime that she recommends resources from outside of purity culture, even, she somehow manages to turn it into something <laughs> that's actually really shaming and disempowering and shitty. And it's just all fucking bad. So um, I think it goes without saying that this, uh, you know, course is especially like proof that Bethy is very much not deconstructing. She is not becoming a more progressive or better version of herself. If anything, she's just further digging her heels in. And also we talked about this the last time we talked about Bethy, but just because she has decided to be hyper fixated on the topic of sex and intimacy doesn't mean that she's being more progressive about it, right? She's just shifted her uh, laser focus <laughs> of, of shame and judgment about sex and intimacy to be about women not having an enough or not being adventurous enough, not doing it often enough, not thinking about it in the right way. She's still very much operating under the premise that she has the keys to the kingdom and the answers to all of life's deep questions about sex and intimacy and that she will tell you the definitive TM correct way to conduct yourself about sex and intimacy. And if you're doing it anyway, that Bethy says that you shouldn't be doing it, then you're wrong. You're going to hell. You're wrong. This is outside of God's design. This is bad. This is not honoring. And this is all going to lead to disaster and ruin, which is not a flex. Like this is not a good thing. This is not a progressive take. This is not helpful. This is the same shitty fucking uh, purity culture advice that's just been repackaged to seem slightly more progressive because we're talking about sex toys now. And like, I just don't have the patience for this. So um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys have thoughts and feelings, please let me know. I'm sure this will bring up a lot of feelings for folks. We have a lot of videos on the channel about purity culture and sexual trauma and things like that. I have a specific video about sexual trauma that I'll put up here if you want some actually useful <laughs> advice um, for free also. But otherwise, uh, thank you for being here. Like the video if you like the video. You can subscribe to the channel. We do talk about stuff like this. We also do a cute pop culture moment, so I'd love to have you stay for that. Um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday. Okay, bye.